All right, this is JPEG to Raw Photo Review number 30. And uh, we're doing the April, round, no, sorry, round one of the May photos. Going to split May into two shows. So tonight we're going to go over the May photos. A little behind, I was traveling and stuff, so we're going to try and catch up now. But uh, tonight is going to be the May photos. If you, uh, let me go first right into how you can enter. So you go over to JPEG to Raw, go to Photo Contest, Photo Contest Entry. And hopefully this works. Yeah, July. There you go. Um, <laughs> you go there, jpegdraw slash contest is how you get there. And you can enter either the uh, beginner or beginner's group or the other group. Both themes this month is open. We're going to stick with open for a little bit. You can enter right here from the web page. Or if you don't want to do that, the easier way, if you're a member of our Facebook groups, or if you want to be, if you're on Facebook, a great way is to go over and enter just right from Facebook. And there are some links right down below on how to get there. If you're in the group, the album or the, whatever you call it, the album is pinned to the top of the Facebook group. So you can go right there and enter that. This is some of the entries going on now for July. So real easy to enter. You have until the end of the month and then that month's over and we start a whole new month. So what's the 22nd? You have like um, 11, 10, no, nine more days. You have nine more days to enter um, to get in there and get going. End of July already. It's crazy. It is, yes, moving fast. Wow. All right. So tonight we have, let me get this ready. Whoops. What am I doing? I'm a little rusty. I hadn't done a show in a while, so I may mess up a few times. There we go. Oh, my goodness. You're putting it first, even. Look at you go, Mike. Yeah. It's going to be the first one up because I, I wanted to make sure the person was here because yeah. we've encouraged this person to enter and I want to make sure they're here. And awesome. that they see that we're doing their image. But the first one up tonight is Jan. Yay! Let me do her <laughs> name a little different. Jan, in case Jane. for some, because there's some folks that normally aren't here every week. So just so you know, as long as I've been doing this show, as far as I can remember, Jan has been here every single show. Yep. Like nonstop. Jan, Every single show she's been here. We love having Jan out there. Jan awesome. uh, entered into our beginners group with this photo of her, um, I'm assuming it's her dog. It says, this was a crop to put more focus on the dog and not on distracting background items. I think perhaps there may be too much negative space on the top. It was taken in manual. Um, I do want to mention before, because I know sometimes we run a little bit long and then um, some people leave before the end. Tonight's going to be a little bit special. Not only do we have Jan entering for the first time, but... I have some images AD is going to critique. <laughs> I gave him four, wanting him to give me some, uh, th to maybe edit one of them, pick one, and edit it. And like AD does everything, he, he does a great job and does more than you ask. And he did all four of them. So I'm sure he'll have comments. So you'll get to see Mike be critiqued later tonight. Um, but cool. for now, let's, let's talk about Jan's image here. Yeah, so Jan, um, you're, you're on to something there. I'm talking about the negative space. And that's, that's absolutely correct. And you watch the show every week. So that's something, let's talk about that. First of all, I do want to say that like, excellent job. Thank you so much for finally coming and entering. This is a huge step for you to enter a, uh, an image. And so we can now communicate and we have something in common to share and try to boost your creativity. So good job on that. That's a win right there off the bat. Um, and we could stop talking right now, but I know you want to get something out of this, so I'll keep going for a little bit uh, and not run too long. Um, but you're onto something with the the negative space thing. So let's talk about the space right now before we talk about the subject, because um, this is your dog, and this is a this is a if it's not your dog, at least you know where to find a dog that you can practice with, and that's a, a big step as well. Make sure you stay on that. Uh, take what you learned tonight and go right back at this and try some new things to see what you can come up with. So my suggestions for your image, um, in the basics category right now, the first thing that stood out to me, and we'll talk about composition here in just a second. The first thing that stuck out to me was the um, either the settings on your camera or uh, the dog was moving, but it's a little bit what we call back focused. And some cameras will do this with a wide, uh, if you set your focus up to wide. Um, so um, if you're using autofocus, uh, then what you want to do is you want to use a spot focus until you're comfortable with moving the spot around. Now, some cameras don't have a spot. You can move anywhere you want. But most modern cameras today, uh, if you use a, a, a spot 
focus. It'll make a little box in the middle that you can aim. And when it, it'll turn green or orange or whatever your camera does when it's focused, and then it'll fire the shot. So in this case, when you're practicing, uh, I don't want to worry so much. We'll talk about composition, but I don't want you to worry about that right now. We need to make sure that, you know, the very first thing is we want to see the point of action here, which is the the dog and that comp that concentration that the dog has on the ball. I love that the ball has movement, but the, the dog is just slightly out of focus. And that's because the camera chose to pick your background to focus on. So some cameras have what they call phase detection, uh, autofocus. Some cameras have contrast detection. Um, depending on your camera, I've noticed personally that phase detection cameras sometimes like to back focus if you have them like in a wide mode. They'll just be like, oh, background, going for it. Mm -hmm. And that's what they, they pick. And it can be very frustrating because your camera will say it's focused and then you'll look at it on the viewfinder and you know it'll look okay. Um, you wanna always, um, don't be afraid of this. You might hear from other photographers, uh, hey, watch that person chimp. You know, they'll have their they'll have their camera and they'll be like, after they take a shot, they'll be like, yeah. You know, like that. Don't worry about nope, that. Don't you worry do about whatever. That. Yeah, you do whatever you want to do. I suggest when you're trying to learn, take your shot immediately, call it up on the back screen, use your zoom in and zoom in close to where you wanted your focus to be and double check it. Um, and because what, what we would want in focus here on the dog is the face, right on that nose is what we want in focus. Um, so that's what you would want to aim your camera at and use a, uh, a center weighted focusing mechanism where it focuses on a spot in, mm -hmm. in a very small spot in the middle of the screen. Uh, Mike, would you say that's uh, yeah. fair and I, to I, start? She says manual. I'm assuming she means manual exposure. Right. Um, yeah. So we're, we're, I'm assuming she's using auto um, focus. And on my camera, I don't know which one she's using on mine. You have a choice between a single focus and continuous focus. On something right. like a dog, I would actually, to, for me, I used auto uh, continuous focus all the time because I use the back button focus. If you're not, if you're not using that, there are situations where you may want to use the single focus. In this case, I would have used the continuous focus because the dog's moving around. Oh, yeah. But, but yeah, you know, you like can you see that here. Yeah. yeah. Like you said with the, the chimping, especially for us beginners, uh, Jan, uh, maybe AD doesn't have to do as much, but I do it. I do yeah. it. I don't have any, time. the only, the only time I would say, pause on that is if the action is happening that you're wanting to capture and you spend right. too much time looking at the back of the screen and you're missing all the action, that's the time to wait. But the problem of course is, is if all the actions happening, you take all the photos and then you look at the back and everything was messed up the whole time. You've missed it all. So, uh, if the action is continue to happen and I have time, I try and look at the back quite often because I may want to make some adjustments. Yeah, absolutely. And I know, um, I didn't want you. Uh, I kind of wanted to rein you in a little bit, Jan, because of the um, too much negative space on the top. Um, there actually isn't. Um, yeah. The dog is like targeted in the center of the photo, and quite often, um, a targeted photo like this uh, without a composition or uh, anything around it, we would consider more of a snapshot when you're first starting. Um, and that's because it's basically it's the dog, and the whole background is competing all the way around with your subject. So. In order to balance that, what you may want to do is to move the dog over to the right third or to the left third and then leave that blank space. And then the blank space on one side becomes its own entity rather than being all around it, a bunch of entities surrounding the dog. It becomes a single entity then. And then it complements because there's nothing there will go right to the dog automatically. Mm -hmm. So. I wouldn't think about that right now. I think that's way too far down the line for you. Um, I would really work on the uh, getting the focus on the camera so that it's firing uh, uh, right where you want it to. Now, some cameras have a movable focus spot. Some have like a three zone system. Some have a wide. I know my camera has all of those. and It's very confusing. Yeah. Um, and I've more than once gone to take a photo and been on the wrong autofocus mode and been like, what, what's going on here? Like, you know, yeah. and then I realized afterwards that, yeah, duh, I have it on the wrong setting. Um, so I would suggest uh, once you're comfortable, a movable spot is the greatest thing. And a lot of photographers don't use it. But what that is, is 
you'll call up your focus and it'll show a little display in your viewfinder or on the back of your camera. And you, then you could use the little uh, joypad on the back of your camera. Some people, they just have a button and it'll move it that spot around. And so you can actually move it to the, the thirds, right? And then your shot, as it's composed, you get focus when the dog is in that is over in the thirds and you end up with that negative space automatically where it's supposed to be when you shoot. Um, but yeah, I would start with that first, just work on getting that focus right on the nose. We would want it right on the nose of the dog here because that's the action is right in that face, right? Yeah. And it's right at the ball. And you can see that the ball and the nose are almost on the same plane there. Everything else though, your, your exposure is great here. Um, I don't see it's not overexposed at all. The dog, I can see all the detail, I'm uh, pointing at my screen. Of course, you can't see that, but <laughs> but um, everything else looks great. It's uh, right now get nail that that tack sharp focus because that's the key thing that's going to draw our eye. And unfortunately, because the background and you mentioned it, yeah. the background is back focused right now, which means it's focused on the background mostly. Your eye is automatically drawn to that negative space because that's what's the clearest part. And we always. You know, our eyes try to focus all the time, so we're always looking for the clear. Jan so. said she was throwing the ball while trying to take the, the pictures. I, I know I've tried <laughs> oh to take. Oh my gosh, that's a lot. Yeah, of that work. makes it extra difficult. And I've tried to take photos of my dogs in the past. The one, because the, the one of the suggestions I would give her, which also is going to make it more difficult, but it will, uh, I think it will um, really give you some some good looking photos, is to almost sit on the ground, get down to the to the dog's level. But what I've always had happen when I do that is they want to come up to you and get in your lap. So throwing oh, yeah. the throwing the ball like you do in Jan, you maybe sit down or you know get down lower and uh, then throw the ball. And when they're coming back at it, but the action is happening fast. She says she uses the uh, what is it? The, I think it's the Canon. Of, I forget it. Oh, there it is. The T six S. I'm thinking that's a Canon, but I'm not positive. Um, so I don't know the systems on that. I can tell you on my Nikon, one of the things it has on most modern Nikon's is this 3D. Um, focusing. I've never had luck with that. I don't yeah, like that at all because the, it's picking things like, in the background and stuff like that. So I think, like you said, when you're just yeah. trying to you're getting into it and you're, and you're trying to learn your camera, I like sticking with. The middle. Yeah, I like sticking with that just, one. Yeah, yeah, just put it in the middle for now. And so what what's going to happen, Jan? Is you're gonna you're gonna take a thousand million photos, and one of the times you go out there, you're gonna get that setting, and it's every photo is going to be in focus where you wanted it to be. And that's going to click with you. And I think at that point, then we can kind of move on to all this other stuff, but make it easy on yourself. Get somebody to throw the ball or something. I mean, that's rough. I couldn't, I really, that was, that would be crazy but, to try to try to try to do that myself and yeah. one hand on a ball, one trying to, no way, man, I couldn't do it. <laughs> but great, but great idea to get action Absolutely. with the dog. So yeah. keep doing that jam. We'd love to see some more. You know, take, go out there some more and take some more photos when maybe in the cooler parts of the day as it's so hot around here or Absolutely. at least where Good I'm Good job. At. Thanks, Jan. Oh, that's awesome. All right. Up next is another person who submits all the time. Um, there we go. Kristen Lee Anderson. Hey, I don't know if she's out there tonight, but Kristen Lee Anderson, she says this photo came out of a senior session. Um, and I did that. She did at the beginning of May. Let's see. With the, with the vines on the side of the building, I knew it would be a great photo opportunity. I know she was in the very center, but I'm wondering more about the, my edit, still trying to determine my style. And with a few quick adjustments in Photoshop and a few layers added, I tried to achieve a sunset haze feel to this photo. And then she okay. gets, her set, gets her settings. Yeah. And I see the, um, at the top, um, I see that there's like a kind of like a, looks like a lens flare at the top. First of all, you know, great idea with the settings and we won't talk about composition. I'll you know, we talk about that every week. We talk about different things with portraits and stuff. And it's clearly that she's trying to like nail down things one at a time here. So let's really focus on um, her questions about the, the you know, achieving a look or a style. Um, it takes a long time to, um, and, and for me personally, I can tell you from my personal experience, I went through many different uh, chrysalis to become what I am now and what I do now. And um, it, what I do now may not appeal to certain people that used to follow me. 
uh, for what I did then. Uh, and that's okay. But for me as an artist or a photographer to grow, uh, I had to find what made me happy mm -hmm. when I processed. That was like, and when I shot too. Uh, and so I think it's easy to find, well, I don't want to say easy, but I think it's easier to find what makes you happy to shoot. Um, I think that comes sometimes comes naturally. Like you'll just find something that's your favorite right. subject and you'll end up shooting that more than anything else. So that kind of develops itself without too much work on your part. Now, some people um, will shoot everything. I'm one of those people. I shoot everything. I just, if I have a camera, I just want to take pictures. That's, that's kind of what I do. And, and I wouldn't show half of them or even, 90% of them to anybody, but I do them because I want to practice and, and try different things. But you you know that I'm kind of known for certain things that I do, Mike. And if you followed, um, and that developed over just me going after what I wanted to do. But my style, my style has morphed. Um, I started with HDR and, and I did all the wrong things with HDR. I was told they were the wrong things. Now, they weren't the wrong things. They were me experimenting, and that's right. That's exactly what you should do. You shouldn't listen to anybody. To you shouldn't stop because anybody tells you to stop. You should keep going. Right. So don't ever, don't ever stop. And just because somebody doesn't like your work, that's fine. At any given time, fifty percent of the world's not going to like what you do. So that's just you know that's the world. Yep. Uh, but ultimately, in the long run, what you really need to strive for is what makes you happy. And then hopefully what makes you happy is that you want to produce quality. I mean, that's, you know, you, you think about how good is my work? Isn't we always ask ourselves, am I doing a good job? And I, did I do this, but at some point you'll start being like, well, I want to process the color this way. I want the skin tones this way. I want the light to shine in. Maybe I like rays or I like mist or whatever. Um, and, and you'll develop that over time. So I think you're starting to do that now. And I think that's great. Um, and, and I think more so I would look into, Kristen, I would consider looking into things like color grading. Um, I know with portraits, uh, it's skin tone is everything. Mm -hmm. um, skin tone alone will get you jobs. Um, and, and, and so developing those skills, working with HSL and um, frequency curves, all of that kind of stuff, learning all of that will help you immensely into getting nice, even skin tone with nice, even light. So in with your photo, I, I see some blemishes here and there, some things that I would work on with the skin. Now, you don't have to do like crazy Photoshop plastic Barbie work because this is a beautiful subject to begin with. She's she's mm -hmm. gorgeous. So you, you don't have to do a lot of work. But a lot of times um, just the light sometimes will play uh, off people's skin uh, unevenly. So you want to be able to control that a little bit. Especially when you're around a lot of green like this, you could get some green tint on, on the skin. You could. Yeah. And I'm seeing a little bit of that. It's not, you know, like I'm looking at a JPEG that's been transferred yes. over, you know, <laughs> and I'm internet. looking at it on an uncalibrated monitor. Right. Um, so I think it's little things like that, but I think you're definitely on, on the right track here. I love the, the, like the sun flare. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, uh, you'll have fun with, I hope, as a portrait photographer. And a lot of things, a lot of times you're taught not to do this. A lot of times you use reflected sun. You'll bring a big reflector out with you, or um, you'll shoot with the sun, you know, behind a tree, or you wait till the sun goes behind the clouds to get the diffused light. Try shooting with the sun behind your subject. It's amazing some of the, yeah. the shots you can get. And I think that's kind of what's kind of that feel I get when I see this is summer, you know, with the sun, kind of the sun flare going on there. So I think she's on the right track. Just keep going and keep pushing it, Kristen. I, th I think you're doing really well. All right. I have it, one question for you, AD. Yeah, go ahead, man. The, the crop on the, the hand on the leg. So I know there are certain rules. I don't know what those rules are particularly, <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. Should you have showed all the fingers or cropped even a little bit higher? I can't imagine you'd want to do mid hand, um, but you know, I think Can you do would, mid fingers. Yeah, when we talked, when we talk about like, and, and so we're not going to go deep into composition here, but okay. I know the beginners like to know some of this stuff. Um, to me, I have to look at this photo and I have to say, what is the most impar important part of this photo? Yes. And so, 
Um, I think it's her face. I think I personally, I would get close up. I would, that hand wouldn't be an issue for me because it wouldn't be part of the shot. I don't know if that makes sense. If, if you're going to, if you're going to do a body shot, let's see it. Let's see the hand. Let's, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, three quarter leg, you know, the whole put her smaller in the frame. It seems like what I see a lot in composition is people put their subject like right in the, I don't know zone as I like to call it. It's like, I'm not close enough and I'm not far enough away back. I'm at the zone where they fill the frame, but I'm not sure if it's where they should be or not. I see that a lot. Yeah. And it, it just seems like there's not enough space around the image the way it is, or it's not close enough for me. So that just tells me that, yeah, you're probably right. The hand's cut off. That's part of it. But yeah, we'd have to see that hand. If we're going to get a full body shot, let's get it all. But then I would probably, I would probably like turn her the other way um, with her back towards the wall, looking towards me. I guess it depends on the person and their side, their good side, as we say. Yeah. But then sometimes you have to shoot from the absolute other side too um, to get that. But it's, I'm not sure that it, I'm comfortable with leaning into the wall f- the way she is. Like it gives me that yeah. against the wall sort of feeling. I don't, I'm not in, I don't like that look. So I probably would have turned her a little bit and have her look over her shoulder and, and probably done a closer up shot here and then a farther away shot, but not this right at this point where she fills the frame. And we've said this before, think if, you know, Worst case scenario, she wants a, a copy of this print, right? And she goes to have it printed and matted and put in a frame. We're going to cut off her hand at the top, too, when it gets framed. Because the matting is going to squeeze in even more. Oh, yeah. You didn't leave enough. You don't have enough at the top. That's a good point. That yeah. I, I, I don't think about that a lot either. That Because you're wanting to fit stuff tight in that frame, in the, in the photo, when you're taking it. Yeah. But you're yeah. not thinking about what is my end result. Is this, is this going to go into a frame? Yeah, that's gonna be mad. I always like You're to come lose. out yeah. a little bit farther than yeah. yeah. I like to come back a little bit farther than needed, um, not a lot, but just a little, so I have that wiggle room. Right. And then, but I think for this, like this particular shot, the way this is framed, I would have gone closer. Yeah. And she may have cropped this to cut some of that out. We don't know. Um, yeah. She didn't say anything like that. I will say that while there's a lot of foliage in there that could be distracting, every time I look at it, it goes straight to her face. So yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, she's gorgeous. To me, there's that, not something yeah. that's really pulling me away. I go right, right. to the face. Yeah, so great. I think this. Yeah, yeah, the softness of tones around her kind of works in that favor too. Mm-hmm. I think she she's very defined and and it looks uh, it looks you know good the way it is. I, I these are just suggestions for playing around with the crop. I always tell everybody, hey, playing with the crop is free, right? <laughs> you <laughs> don't even have to. You don't even have to press the button again. You can just. Move the crop tool around and see what different looks look like. And yep. like I've been doing with my edits this week, you can start all over again. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. All right. Up next is one of our, our favorite people, too. We're going into the regulars group now, and this is Millen. Millen. Millen is submitting, um, let's see, Sonot? I can't even pronounce that. Um, some kind of peak. As locals call this mountain, it's uh, the, whatever name he gave it, S M. E-O-D-V, smart off. Smart off, yeah. As locals call this mountain, it's located near the town of another word I can't pronounce. (laughs) Oh my gosh, yeah. (laughs) This is a magical place to spend some time. The nature there is amazing. I was at at my village for the day near sunset, and I've had some minutes to take a small walk. This was this guy I saw for about five to six minutes, and it was gone. Amazing. Because yeah, he says, I took it many, at shots at angles and at many different angles and positions. Uh-huh. But this is the one that was his favorite. Yeah. Oh, and so it's built and, from and, 16 vertical shots. Oh, nice. Yeah. And so, so yeah, what he probably did is shot two rows of yeah. eight verticals. So, yeah, Millen, um, you know, you're, you submit all the time to us. So, um, I'll tell you a couple of things. A, you love this shot the best that's all that really matters you know we've talked to you we've we've dragged you through the mill a couple of times (laughs) with with your edits and 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 you've learned so much i think um ultimately you know what i see from millen is he's starting to kind of come into his his style and what he wants to do and what makes him happy 
And I think that that's the most important part of, of doing photography. Um, you know, the, the, if you've ever seen the film, um, and I can't think of the name, but if you build it, they will come. Yeah. Field of you Dreams. Know, field of Dreams. Um, essentially, photography is like that. We, a lot of times we'll come out of the gate wanting an audience. So we'll start tapping and trying to build the mousetrap, as I say. Um, we're trying to we're trying to make photos that people like, right? That's that's our goal. Like, do you think people will like this? Is this good? And then after a while, you start thinking to yourself, like, well, what what does it matter? Like, does it matter if I please these folks, or does it matter that I'm uh, I, I'm doing my life's work and and making myself happy with what I'm doing and enjoying what I'm doing? Because that's the important part. And you won't get to the best work that you do until you can let that all go and just do what makes you happy. So you can always seek knowledge. I don't tell anybody, like, never stop seeking knowledge, but make sure it's making you happy and you're not, you know, following someone else's thing, you know, because um, it's an easy trap. I see a lot of people get into that and and they play for the likes, they play for the comments and all that kind of stuff. And I've seen Millen kind of go on and doing his own thing and his stuff has gotten a lot better since he started to do that. Um, I don't know, Mike. Um, you know, I have comments uh, on on this, and if Millen, I would say, like, if Millen is wants those comments, I'd be more than happy to uh, invite them. But I also don't want to make any comments that would stop him in what he's doing because he's he's pretty much doing it. You know, he, he's moving forward. So um, right. it's up to you. Um, I, I'm not sure. I wish Millen was here. He's he's in a different time zone. Yeah, yeah. He watches it after time the fact. Planet. <laughs> he watches after the fact. Millen, do me a favor, buddy. Um, when you submit your next one, um, let me know in your comment, because I know you'll watch this. Let me know in your comments if you're cool with me using your work as an example for other people. Because I, I really, you know, there's some things I would say about the photo that I would suggest to others. But I don't want to, I don't want you to think I'm criticizing your work directly. Um, and that's always a tricky, uh, tricky area when someone's submitting in the regular sure. group, right? That, um, um, but I do like to you know, once in a while and Millen, we've given him, we've talked about his photos a lot. And, yes. And, um, so, uh, let us know. And, oh, and Millen, if you could, could you put everything in phonetics? Cause Mike and I are, <laughs> we can't, Mike we much can't worse. Read anything. Uh, I, I still struggle with, it. I, I'm, I usually come out and say what it is. And then people are like, uh, no, no, that's not even close. So. All right. Just saying I need to turn you up a tad. Oh no. I'm that, not speaking loud enough. That right. and uh, closer. Let's see, I don't know. Maybe this is the new Skype or whatever, or just Mike being rusty. <laughs> second, second there, Greg said he had some echo. It's going to be interesting when I go to. Hopefully, that's not in the recording. Um, and Dave says turn uh, AD up a tad. So, um, say something, AD, real quick. Hello, 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 hello. So you're coming Hello's. through to me a lot louder than what I'm talking. Yeah, that's weird. So hopefully that's good. So, all right. Keep giving <laughs> we'll me feedback as we, as we talk here, uh, chat room, and I'll try and correct as we go along. But let's, let's move on to the next image. And this one is, let me find it. Oh, where's it at? There it is. This one is from Amber. Amber says, since I'm still healing from a leg injury, I'm playing, oh. in, I'm playing indoors. I don't have the proper speed lights, sound triggers. I don't have those either to do real speed photography. But I did have fun with this. Uh, playing with stuff dropping in water is a lot of fun. <laughs> I will tell you that. Uh, until I'm healed up, this is probably the best I can do for now. So, one, thank you, uh, Amber, for even why you're um feeling bad and you know laid up that you're still entering images and still finding things to play with yeah so, absolutely um and if you look around amber if you do some searches on the internet um for like uh, speed trigger diy um, i know that you can find some apps for your phone and some special little cables that you plug into your phone and your phone will actually record the sound and when the sound hits uh, clap or whatever, it will actually it'll trigger the shutter on your camera and it flashes in the whole wow. nine yards and, and capture it. Now, with that said, it probably isn't going to be fast enough to do it properly. And ultimately, what you'll end up wanting to do 
Um, I saw a thing. This is a the, a cool like um, a guy took a tablespoon and he um, screwed it to uh, I don't know if it was a table, but whatever it was, it was like a flat board that was big, and he had the the spoon just hanging out, and it wasn't screwed down so that it was solid. It kind of had a little bit of give in it, uh, and he filled the spoon with milk, which is weird, I know, but and then he had one wire on the spoon. And then one wire uh, propped up with an alligator clip just below the spoon, and he would drop a strawberry onto the spoon. And when it hit the spoon, the spoon would bend down and touch the other wire. And as soon as it did, those two wires were hooked to the shutter of his camera (laughs) from a remote control Mm. that he just bought off the shelf. And it would fire the camera, and you, he would get these beautiful strawberry milk splashes in the spoon. So there's stuff, though. There's projects like that on the internet that will teach you step-by-step step on how to put those fun projects together. And if you're hurting and you're trying to heal and you want to learn that stuff, I think that's great for people to learn, like, those other things like, you know, building a trigger yourself or maybe learning to solder, which is something that, like a lot of people don't know how to do. But you can learn how to do that. So uh, definitely check it out. And this is an amazing like capture that she got this the way she did because um, I'm, I'm sure this was like a skewer through a balloon or something. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm thinking. And it's very hard to do uh, you know, and get the timing just right with the flash and the camera and everything else. And I did water drop photography for a long time without a trigger and – uh, it was just frustrating. I, I would take thousands of shots and maybe have one that was like lopsided, you know? Yeah. Like, no, I did that too. That was a lot of fun to play that with. Yeah, that with, with yeah it, it is. You learn, right? Yeah. You learn different things for that. Now, there used to be a product out called Trigger Trap, which you could get for your phone, which was an advanced system um, that had a like a little module. I still have mine. It's around here someplace. Um, and you plug it into your phone's uh, headphone jack and it – actually would trigger it in time. It actually does a bunch of other things like long exposure HDR and ramping and all sorts of different stuff, but um, you can't get those anymore. So I highly suggest check out the DIY stuff that's out there because there's plenty of it uh, and they're good tutorials and you might learn something other than photo stuff that will, you know, just broaden your horizons a little bit. So anyways, Amber, get well soon, please. Well, this, hopefully she's well now. This is back in May. So uh, I don't know, man. My It took forever for my finger to heal up. I can't imagine a, a leg injury. That's Goosh. true. All right. Up next is this image from uh, Christina. Christina. Christina Benj. Benj. Yes. And she says, a rose in her garden after it rained. I was shooting a after the rain as a prompt. <laughs> I think she's doing one of those 365 projects. So yep. this was that day's um, project. Well, I love this. Nice and soft. It's a rose. Yeah. I mean, you know what it is. Um, flowers and water. Um, I well, Perfect together. <laughs> yeah. And I will sometimes, if it doesn't rain, like it hasn't rained here. It actually rained yesterday finally, but that was the first time in like four weeks or something that we've got rain. Um, I'll go out with a spray bottle mm-hmm. and – you know, or after we water the the plants or whatever. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just such a cool look. It's cool atmosphere and the water always clings to each flower differently. Um, so yeah, I think this is wonderful. Good color here. A uh, good point of focus right on the, I love the little drop of water right on the edge of the rose. I do too. I think uh, that's very At cool. Yep. I think um, probably the only thing that I would suggest here is you have a couple of um, bokeh out, reflections if you look center of the rose and then down um uh probably two-thirds of the way down the photo there's a couple of like half moon uh light reflections i probably any little splotches like that i'd probably clone those out because they're brighter if you notice than anything else around and that tends to pull our eye into that um and then also um christina always be wary of your corners uh and dark corners Um, if they're not balanced, because if we have like a, if you look lower left, there's quite a dark triangle in the corner Mm -hmm. down there. And that's, uh, I would clone that out for sure. Um, cause that's going to draw your eye to that corner. 
uh, subliminally. Anytime you have a high contrast triangle in a corner, it's kind of a no-no because it, it will distract you from the main subject here, which I think is really the upper part of this image in the upper third. And I don't want to you know, I don't want to wander too off, far off from that. I really like that zone of the image. So, all right. Yep. Other than that, though, gorgeous, <laughs> amazing. Right. Up next is uh, this image from Stephen Meese. Stephen Meese. Uh, where is it? There we go. Is Stephen that Meese. multiple mooses? <laughs> Meese. <laughs> Meese. It's a herd. Yeah. Awesome. Um, he says, "Pro Sesco Vineyard in Northern Italy." First off, awesome that you were in northern Italy. Yeah, maybe, Prosecco, yeah. That's maybe he lives amazing. there. I don't know if you're visiting, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, I took the I took I yeah, took the blue mountains and adjusted the hue to a more of a green. And we'll talk about yep. my mountain issues in some of my photos. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> it's always fun. It looked a little off, so I dropped its saturation to compensate. It kind of neutralized the sky a bit too. Then yep. cropped it. Cropped it out as well, so the bushy tree to the left, uh, as well as the bushy tree to the left. Okay. Cropped yeah. at 16 by 10. Let's see. Trying to keep some consistency throughout the image. Not trying to make things pop. Just thinking, rethinking the way I work on my landscape. Landscape to me is, maybe we can talk about this when we get to my photos. You're, wa you're looking at beautiful sceneries. Yep. And... I struggle to can get that where I can convey it to someone else. So that to capture that, that, you know, the scale or yeah. just the beauty you're seeing. So, you know, what's interesting about that is it's so a lot of us, especially if we deal with, you know, I deal with technology an awful lot. So I have a, a heavy left brain, but I also am a uh, slave to my creative side, which is my right side of my mm -hmm. brain. But to the point where a lot of times um, I'm not thinking about which brain is really doing what and when I'm out there. So uh, I've, I make it a point when I go out now to really like, how am I feeling right now? Wh why am I putting my camera here? Why am I mm -hmm. compelled what just made me go, God, I got to take a picture of this. I have to take this home. I got to show other people. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm amazed I'm here and, and whatnot. Um, and then I try to kind of stick that in my brain. So when I'm back home in, in front of the computer and processing, how do I get that feeling? And do I remember those feelings to get somebody to have that same feeling? Well, one of the things is we try to draw people into our image. Um, that's what photos do. They're a, a window to another world. So in order to draw things in, they have to be inviting. So he mentioned it like right in his description right off the bat. And I love it when people do this. Please do more of this, guys. Send in like what you're doing with your photos because this is great. Mm -hmm. So he said in there that there are blue mountains in the back. So sometimes when you're shooting in shade and you set your white balance, uh, other – things in the distance that aren't in shade might be in light or things that are, are shaded and not in light will be a different white balance. And it's a very frustrating thing to, right. to do. And there, there's no shortcut around it. Sometimes we just have to like paint in um, with a, with an adjustment brush and do it manually. Sometimes you can get away with um, just the white balance slider alone without doing a lot of HSL work or curve work or anything like that till the end. Um, so the very first thing I grab is I usually will grab my uh, my white balance um, slider uh, between yellow and blue. And I will just start playing with that just in very little movements. And a lot of times when I have a scene like this, it's lush and green. The sun was out. Uh, I want people to feel warm. I want people to be invited. Warmth means we want to embrace it for most people. Um, there are not too many people to see a freezing cold scene and be like, oh, geez, I wish I was walking <laughs> through that scene in my short, short sleeve shirt and, yeah. you know, how I am right now. Um, and, of course, everybody's different and you're, you're going to get people, you know, obviously see a mountain and they're like, man, I love to climb that mountain. That's all I think. Um, and that's a different story and I would probably process that different. But here we have a warm scene. Um, looks like it might have been summer over there, spring. Uh, you know, it looks warm. I'm going to say it is in the summer because of the – the the um all I mean, of the yeah. 
Yeah, well, all of the grapes are out and everything. So immediately I would say move your slider, just your white balance. Just start with that. Move that towards the warm side a little bit. Um, so I edited this photo, and I wanted to share that with oh, you, Mike. Cool. So can we do a screen with yes, this? Yes, yes. Oh, cool. Let me get ready. Yeah, Gary, we're going to talk about that white sky. So. Oh, boy. Um, I'm so gonna go. I'm just going to do that, and you can can you put me full screen? Yes. Uh, there we go. Sweet. There you go. Okay, so let's get this out of the way. You should be seeing my oh, wrong photo. I see a different photo. So now we know which that's, other one you're gonna do. That's coming. <laughs> Don't worry. Okay. All right. So let's look at the. So this is the photo as he sent it. Okay. So this is just right off off the um, the way that he sent it. So the so the very first thing I'd probably do is is over here on the the temperature slider is I'd warm it up. Now if you immediately notice. What happens here as I'm warming this image up? Look at how bright it's getting. Yeah, I mean it's it's like the exposure. So you can compensate. You can just pull the exposure back a little bit, but that's going to get rid of those blue mountains in the background without disturbing your sky. Your sky is going to change color a little bit, but you'll still get blue if there is some in there. But he's changed that kind of, so I can't really get that back. So I kind of just went with it. So here's the edit that I did, Mike. So immediately, you'll notice a few changes right off the bat. One of them was um, that the photo kind of moved a lot. Um, and all I did was uh, I started with this photo by removing all distractions that I could find with well, the image. You got, so, of, you got rid of one of them that was distracting me on the road. Right. So so let's just go back. So uh, so here's the unedited image. Well, let's really make it unedited by putting that that back the way he had it. So so we have this uh, guy down here in the road. We got this little guy right here. We got this little guy right here, which is horse poop, I'm pretty sure. Um, and I have nothing against horse poop except for, like, that's not the focus of this photo. It's the, uh, the yeah. winery and vineyards and kind of things. Um, I got rid of this little uh, – this is a tie-down for the actual stand. Um, each one of these, I think, is tied at the end to tension it so that it'll stand upright. Um, so I think that's part of the cable cover that that some of these have on them okay. or one that was still there. So I took that out. This was just simple, by the way, just so you know. I just took the, uh, the clone out brush and this has gotten so good that really that's all you need to do and boom, it's gone. And, and I moved it over because it did clone yeah. that leaf. So, so you don't want to see that secondary leaf there. Um, so I would just, you know, I'd Drag say, oh, there's a leaf there. Bit. So, so I put it over here, far enough away that nobody's going to see anything side by side. And then, boom, just like that, that's out of there. Um, these, the same thing. You just use the clone brush and paint over them once. There was also a couple of telephone poles, and there's actually wires back here. And he did a really good job of kind of just – those wires are kind of blended in. Mm -hmm. But there's actually power poles going through. I took uh, the adjustment brush and I uh, or the um, clone uh, heel brush, and I got rid of those as well. Um, and so those were the, my, my main edits was just uh, the distractions, right? We call we basically call it like border patrol. I just go through the image and like, okay, is this pole uh, making this image more beautiful and more inviting? No, it's not. Goodbye. You know, and I can't do anything about technology in this area. But if it's not part of the story, um, I can make believe it's not there. And in fact, if I was standing there, I'd be doing my best to look at everything but those damn poles. Right. So. When I bring the photo back, I'm getting rid of those poles so other people don't have to struggle with that. Um, so that's that's why I would make that edit. Now, would I, you know, paint in a big tree right here? No, I'm not going to do that. But I do feel it's okay to remove distractions from your image. Um, not so much alter the image. Like I'm not going to make this into an autumn scene or anything like that. If that's your jam, I'll put then a different that's cool. mountain back there. Whatever. Yeah. If that's your jam, that's that's cool. Um, Gary talked about the sky. Yeah, Gary, I probably the white sky here. Um, yeah, uh, it's hard to say. I played with the crop a little bit a couple of times and and I, you know, I brought it down. Uh, I didn't think that this really did anything no. for it. The thing I, um, I, I know what Gary's talking about it. And I have run into that, too, where the sky is unless you do an HDR image here with you know multiple sets. You're going to blow out the sky most likely uh, in those scenarios. But you, yep. I like having the tops of those mountains so you can see them. 
You can get you can right. get that. Otherwise, when you crop it like you just did, you don't know how much taller those mountains go, and that sometimes is fine. But in this scene, I'd like having those crop those tops. Yeah, and so sometimes also um, lenses, depending on wide whatever they are, will tend to take mountains that are very tall and make them look squashed. Yeah. So another favorite trick that I like to do sometimes is actually pull this into Photoshop and stretch those back out to where they look more normal. Um, that's that's kind of a trick that Trey showed me with some of his shots, mm. and I've done that with a few of mine. I've been like, yeah, you know, when I was there, they were much taller than the lens. The lens is squashing them, so I would just like take the marquee tool and then stretch that part of the photo just a little bit and be like, wow, okay, that's exactly – like it looked to me. Um, here, there isn't much choice, though. I couldn't really do anything with it. I did bring a little bit of the, the clouds back by just pulling the highlights down. But mainly, for me, uh, I thought that this tree was was quite a distraction here. There's really nothing you can do about this. In his image, it's quite a bit darker, though. So what I did is I lightened it up a little bit because dark places tend to just draw your eye. So if you look at this image immediately, I, I look here, I look here, and I look at this row pretty much. And then finally at the road, right? Those are like the, the main components here. But look at all this, like the valley beyond is gorgeous. And you've got these this stuff out here. I kind of want to make this like uh, the foreground and background. I want to make it into a minimalist image, even though there's all this stuff going on. And the only way that you can do things like that is by balancing the tones a little bit and and not having so much dark and so much light. So all I did for for the changes there, and you'll see that there that is very subtle because he said he didn't want to make it pop too much. Yeah. So I stuck I stuck to that because I would have gone farther with this image. Um, I would have gone a lot farther with this image because I like the sunlight that's coming down from the left. I would have really accentuated those tones a lot and and brought, made this image a lot warmer. I probably would have gone into into this territory with it and, and really started to make it lush and, and, but that's me. And I, and I saw what he wanted. So I kept it muted a little bit. Um, and, and so I just bumped up the shadows just a little bit with these so that they would, they would kind of not distract me so much. And it balances out a little bit with this other light that you have going on here. Mm -hmm. And when you have light parts and shadows, you have to be thinking about, you know, light's going to draw your eye, but shadows are going to draw your eye too. So Unless you want that, you need to balance those areas of your image. Um, and I will say, too, compositions like this are very difficult to deal with because of this road going down one side. Ultimately, we like this road to lead into, into our image, and it's kind of just keeping us nailed off to the side, right? Um, we do have this other leading line here coming across. So we're all really going to this spot in the image. Right. That's where our right. eyes are really being drawn, even though we fight it. We want to look at other things. Even the, the row of uh, grapes are going down that way, too. Yeah. And I did all I did was actually skew the image a little bit to straighten this line because that was kind of a distraction to me as well. With this one leaning in, it, it felt like the whole image was pushing me to the left. That's all I could get with this image was it kept pushing me. It's gorgeous, a gorgeous place. So I just wanted to do it justice. All I did was... I, I just uprighted those so they weren't pushing me so hard. <laughs> and and that kind of, I felt, led, um, lent just a little bit of balance to the way that the road was going. I It still can't push it far enough, though. I mean, it's it's just inherent to that. I wish the road was more towards the middle a little bit. Right. There's not much. You can't, you can't do anything about that. That's how the road is. Some place, you know what? It, I found in all of my travels, yeah. some places just are meant to be enjoyed and not to be taken a photo of. That is true. That is very true. <laughs> so, all right, I'm going to switch back. Okay. So, here we go. And three, two, one, go. There we go. Did I come back? I didn't come back because I switched the wrong back. button. Just, there you I are. switched the wrong button. There I did are. it. You're back now. <laughs> Don't oh. worry. I got one more we can practice with. Okay. So. <laughs> Well, I think, I think we know which one that is, so let's yep. move to the one right before that. Uh, this image here from, who is that from? Angie. Oh, Angie Stodden, yeah. Oops, I'm on the wrong page. Hold on. There we go. Ange Snowdon? Snowed yeah, Snowdon? that's a Snodden, I think. Snodden. Snodden? And Snodden. Yeah. Um, we have been touring around, we've been touring around town looking at all the pretty flowers. 
and just love taking pictures of flowers. And she got a bee on it too. She did get a bee on it. Yeah. And the bee is right in the center. Um, and what, and we've talked about this before with centered shots like this. Um, the flower's gorgeous. I flower, think uh, I love the colors of the flower. Right. And flowers are very difficult. If they're in a group, they're very difficult to take. Um, remember how we talked about the portrait? Mm-hmm. And if it's too far or if it's too close, people tend to take the one in the middle. And this is that same example here where I don't think it's close enough. I would have tried to push myself a little closer. And I know it's intimidating with bees to get close to them. But I will tell you from self-experience, they could care less about you when they've got a flower like this. (laughs) You can get as close as you want. As long as you're not bashing them with your camera, they're very tolerant, uh, especially honeybees. They're just kind of like, yeah, I'm just doing my thing, whatever. Um, So uh, I would have gotten a little closer to this. I think there's a little distraction. I think the mulch. Uh, the the white mulch uh, with the sun reflecting off it looks like a, a a big piece of mulch down here or a board or something. something. Yeah, yeah, and the yellow flowers. I think those are all kind of distracting to me. And I would have gotten closer and filled the frame with this uh, this lovely. Uh, it's just presenting itself perfectly to you. Uh, I would just get. I would crop this in. Like this would be perfect. Um, if you wanted to take this photo and just make one change to see what I'm talking about, do a square one-to-one crop and just crop it right around the flower. And you'll see that now you're, that's your subject. That's, that's everything. It's not in competition with what is that on the ground behind it? And, and, and what kind of flower is that? And I wonder what those flowers are. You know, you have all this stuff that's yelling at you. Right. Um, and, and so, uh, minimalizing your compositions minimalizing your subject matter. If you can get it down to foreground, background, subject, that's great. If you can get it down to foreground, background, that's more of a minimalist, fine art kind of thing. Um, Doing that sort of thing is going to help you. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to stay that way, but you need to get there to understand it. And then once you understand it, you can start developing your own thing around that. Um, so I always tell people this stuff and then they look at one of my photos and like, but you didn't, you didn't do that. And I'm, I'm like, hold on. Look at the photo and do you get a story right. out of it? They're like, oh yeah. I said, because That's I awesome. started there. Yeah. And then and then I've I've added this other stuff for you to learn about the the place I shot. So, so yeah, it's just a, a good starting point. And everything else about this photo though, the colors are popping and the, the focus is gorgeous. Great. Yeah. And the, and the focus on the bee is beautiful. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about this next photo too. Um, two, two great bee subjects here. And I, I struggled with this when I first saw this photo, because I was like, um, I want it closer to the bee because the bee, right. It's, it's the bee. But then I read and it's like, no, the flower. I'm yeah. like, okay, all right. I, get, I dig it. It's, you know, and for me, I guess it was the flower. I, it was the colors and the popping of the flowers, and the bee yeah. was just a, a character in that. Yep. Yeah. And I think that if you made that one flower bigger or you could group the purples mm-hmm. without so much of that big yellow and the white thing there that's kind of – so that's not negative space. If anybody wonders what negative space is, that's that's actually competing space because right. there's things going on in it. There's noise. N- not noise like, like noise, rain. Distractions. Yeah distractions going on true negative space is almost a blank area or it's a a texture you know that can be a a a negative space it's something that's basically a negative space is something that doesn't have as much interest as your subject does um and and bright colors and and contrast changes tend to in our very primal uh beings we tend to are drawn to that so uh, we have to be careful with that in our compositions. So I think it's just flowers are very hard. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I shoot them all the time in our garden, and I'm always disappointed. So um, <laughs> the only time I get a flower shot that I really like is if I rip it off and bring it in the house and I frame it against something where I know I you know have well, – I got that one flower. <laughs> you know, but, but taking them outside in groups, they don't – they're not growing for your no. entertainment. You know, they're, they're doing their thing. So, so yeah, just keep with it though. All right. Uh, last image is an, the one we saw earlier, the B photo with the with this from Jose. Bob uh, spelled his name wrong. That's not how you spell his name. Is J O S E. So that name I had there is wrong. J O S E. Jose. Okay. It's right in the thing you're seeing. It's wrong on what I just put in the feed. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so right. what y'all saw there is is, is wrong. Um, <laughs> Jose Mat- Mat- Matinta? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Matatina, I Matatina. think, uh, but I'm not sure. BC <laughs> Yellow, uh, this, is, this is what he wrote here. BC Yellow was a May gray day in California um, oh, when the sky okay. was totally covered in clouds. This is a great day to shoot flowers and insects. I chose a simple flower like the California tree poppy, a simple yellow and white flower as my background, and waited for the bee. Oh, so you set up waiting for the bee. When, nice. When the, opportunity, oh, when the opportune moment came, I just sprayed and prayed, shooting continuous bursts and hoping one of the dozens of shots can be used. And he goes into, oh, he, and he used um, a ring light. Yes, an LED ring light yeah. at uh, one 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 thousandth of a second, um, w- and use the ring light as well. One thing I'll tell you is that um, don't ever chase insects around. Um, first of all, they don't like it, and that's the best way to get yourself in trouble is by chasing them. Um, if you see an insect, you can go to where they were and set up, and there's a good chance within a few minutes you're going to have another visitor. You're going to have that same visitor back. Butterflies mm-hmm. are notorious Absolutely. for flying away, flying around your house, and then coming right back to the same flower. <laughs> I don't know how they do it. They just mm-hmm. they know where they're going. And I've chased butterflies. I used to chase butterflies all over our garden, and it was so annoying. And then I realized, I'm like, they're just going back to the same place. <laughs> what if I just stood there? And yet, lo and behold, I stood there and – they come back and dragonflies will do it. If you, if you dragonflies will always fly away from you when you approach them. But then if, if you stay there, they'll come back. Yeah. Um, and so, so this is the right approach. Um, Jose is definitely on board with that. Um, when I saw this photo, I loved it right off the bat. I think it's fine the way it is, but I couldn't resist playing with it. So I did pull it into Lightroom and play with it. And just for the fact that we like to show what you can do with photos and and spark creativity sometimes and see what the possibilities are. I did want to show what I did okay. to Jose's photo, and then Jose can be mad at me if I if he wants to. But I'm um, you know I oh. just thought it, it would be fun. So uh, can I share that with you, Mike? Absolutely. Okay. Hopefully he's like me and loves seeing different ideas. <laughs> yeah. Then we'll get to the we'll get to the fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we may all do right. that in post show because we're running a little long, but we can. We That's can, okay. I'll record it all, so it's all there. First, first show back, you know. Yeah. Um, so here's our photo. Um, so the first thing, the product photographer in me, which this is not a product, obviously, but there could be somebody out there who wants to use this uh, as their natural bee products uh, photo or something like that. The very first thing I usually do was like. I would look at this as a very clean photo. You got a nice white background, you got this beautiful yellow flower, and you got this perfect bee. Everything here is great, with the exception of this bee's kind of a little sloppy, and he's got like pollen stuck here and there, and he just hasn't taken a shower lately. So I basically the first thing I did was give the bee a shower. Huh. So I went I went through and I took these little pollen specks and I removed them, um, so they wouldn't be distractions. So it was like. Just the, he had the big thing of pollen and he's going for this flower. So here's the the first thing I did um, was I took the flower and I cut it out in Photoshop and I turned it. And the reason why I did is because it kind of felt like it was not symmetrical in the image. And when I looked at his photo, I kind of felt like there was a flower that was fighting with a bee. That's what I thought that it was like a head to head like tonight's cage match between the bee and the flower. That's what I, you know, when I saw it, that's what I could, that's all I could think of. Um, so to alleviate that a little bit, I thought, can I change this up a little bit so that the bee is the main thing here and the flower is a supporting actor. And the only way I could think about doing that was to kind of remove some of this flower that's taking up half of the screen. So what I did is t- in order to do that, I wanted to make it symmetrical. So I cut out the flower around it, and then I just turned it just a little bit, and I pasted it back down as a layer. And then I changed the crop. So we ended up with this, which now the flower is still represented. You can still see the beautiful focus on the flower, but the bee zeroing in on the flower, the bee is the subject matter here. Because I had mm-hmm. trouble, like, who's the subject? Is, is the bee, is it the flower? 
which is it? And I right. also expanded the top and the bottom because he had this beautiful white background. That was super easy to do. I just raised the crop and then used content aware fill and it filled it in nicely, made it look all look natural. Uh, and then I removed those a uh, few pieces of those pollen that were around. I probably would have continued to clean up a couple of these little areas like right back here uh, on the thorax and, and, and got just a few of those pieces off there. But other than that, um, that was just a creative, fun thing. And I hope Jose is OK with he, me. And he's out there Wait, on Facebook. <laughs> so I know you're not on Facebook, um, AD, but he I is watching from Facebook. And, oh, awesome. And Jose, sorry, I um, – I spelled your name wrong in the feed. I had it right somewhere else. He says, I agree. I was thinking of cropping it also. I thought there was a little too much yellow too. That's all it was for, for me. That's personal though for me. That's just my personal preference. And I'm just coming from like a, if you wanted to, you know, put this out as a stock photo or, or you know, try to sell it. Um, to me, it's uh, if you define your subject as a strong, the bee is very strong for me. Um, but I thought the flower was beautiful as well. And I didn't want to just say this is bee only. We want to give that bee what he's going for. Um, but I didn't want to be like, oh, you know, flower's powerful too. No, it's really about the bee here. So um, that's the reason why I did what I did. But I just wanted to have fun with it. I was, uh, I was, I actually was lacking. Um, you did something for me, Jose, actually, because I've been lacking creativity lately. So when Mike gave me his photos, I went <laughs> hog wild on them. Probably too crazy for him, but I did it anyway. Um, and I went hog wild with yours, too, because it just helped me kind of get my creative juices flowing and, and get some work done. Yeah. So. I and, uh, you know, another another big thing for Jose, what he did here, you mentioned this, A.D., was staying in place and waiting for the bee to come. Yep. So that if you're wanting to, to take photos of insects, like you mentioned multiple times, but again tonight, is set up in a spot where you see them coming in and wait yep. for them to come back. Absolutely. Yeah, um, they, they will come Look back. Look at all those dots. Yeah. I You've know. done a lot of cloning. Yeah, and I just use the standard clone tool. I don't do anything too too drastic here. Um, and it's best basically for for demonstration purposes. I was just uh, just making sure that he was uh, he was a showered bee, you know, because before your models come out, they got to be showered. So, <laughs> Gary says, can you expand it a little more on the right side? Uh, yeah, yeah. And so, if I was to put this in Photoshop, which I really don't want to tax like the yeah. feed or anything right now with doing it, but what I would do is you can load this into Photoshop as a layer, uh, and then you get the crop tool out and you just stretch the crop tool over so there's a blank space over here. You make a, a marquee around that whole space and then right click on it and say fill and then select content aware and it'll just put this nice white gradient right in there and you won't even know it wasn't shot like that. Yeah, you definitely could do that. I like to do I like to do portraits of flowers. Whenever there's flowers and insects, I really stray away from doing landscape mode, and I really love to do portraits. I just something about portraits for me of flowers and insects and bees and stuff. It just gives mm -hmm. them personality. That's just personal per preference, though. I've seen plenty of of landscape versions that have just as much power, if not more. So, all right, I'm gonna unscreen share, Mike. All right. Good. Well, that was the last image. That we had in the official review tonight. Um, cool. We may have something special, but so we're, we're at an hour. So live people, hang around. We're going to go into a post show. I'll record it, and I may include it in the, the show too. But um, I, I want to go ahead and get us start, stopped here um, and go through that. And we'll come around, and we're going to what we're going to do. So you know what you want to stick around. Is <laughs> I gave Ad a few of my photos to critique. Or not to critique, to edit, because I was struggling with the edits on these. So he's going to tell me what he did, but also tell me what I could have done in the first place to make these better. So um, we'll be back here where AD and I'll talk about this later, but, you know, either next week or week after. Before we leave, though, let me bring us over. Remember to enter for next month, but also go over and check out AD's Patreon page. Let me get that up. There we go. Patreon page at thecreators.com where you do different things, uh, you know, different um, how-to videos and that kind of stuff, where if you're uh, a member or a Patreon, you can watch those things live on to your Patreon page. What's anything coming up in the, in the near future? Uh, yes. Um, actually, it's been, you know, summers are a little slow. Um, we don't, uh, I live in the Northeast, so 
I'm not a winter guy. I don't mm-hmm. like to ski or do any of that stuff. I do like to take photos of, of winter scenes, but I really do a lot of my production work during the winter, so I'm more active. But during the summer, I'm usually out or traveling or doing something. So the videos have been a little uh, less, but we are uh, starting to kick in back again. Towards August, we'll, we'll be rolling more videos. The next thing I'm going to be talking about, though, is um, – we're going to be doing a special on Topaz Studio and creativity mm. with your photographs, which means uh, working with textures and working with um, different color palettes and trying uh, different things like how to grade a photo or do color grading or actually steal a palette from a famous painting and put it on your photo. Weird mm. things uh, that just spark your creativity a little bit. So um, that's coming up. I'm hoping to um, be able to do that tomorrow. Monday, mm. tomorrow. Very good, yes. So, yeah. Monday, I'll be looking for that. So check cool. out thecreators.com uh, over on Patreon. Also check out AD's website, theexplorographer.com over there. And you have a lot of stuff. You have learned photography. You have where's uh, your store. We, right fixed the sto- we fixed the store finally too. If anybody's tried to use the store lately, it's been kind of wonky. Um, it is all fixed now. So I guess I missed all that because it's always worked for me, but – you have, a, <laughs> you have a number of, you know, uh, I guess in Lightroom, you have the presets and actions. And uh, I did, hey, I bought Aurora, by the way. Oh, I think cool. last, since we've talked, I've bought it since the last time we talked. I have that. Yeah, now. They, up, they upgraded it majorly now. It's uh, up to the same level as the Mac, as is Luminar now. Yeah, when they, so. had, they had a sale going on or something, and I yep. ended up going ahead and buying it. And I've used cool. it a few times since. And then, uh, Get some luminar stuff there, so you you're slowly growing more and more tools out there for, for purchase. Yes, and, and I've reasonably actually, priced. Yeah, I've also included um, now. I'm including um, hand picked signed prints now too, as well. Which, um, if anybody's ever been on my website, I sell everything that I shoot, but there's a small selection of prints that I pull from each of my stories that I personally print on metal. And I sign them and certificate them and keep them to limited numbers of just 15 prints only. And I've started to finally, um, Mike, if you go to store uh-huh. and then to signed um, prints, there's prints and then signed prints. There we go. Yep. So uh, those are actually the full metal like deal. They come signed and numbered and they have a certificate on the back of them. They're ready to hang. They're metal. They're printed. Uh, they're actually sublimation dye in uh, aluminum. Recycled aircraft aluminum. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I do sell those on my website now too. I haven't never done that before, but we're finally starting to get some of our inventory up. All these photos that I have around here are all all stock that I have. So I remember this one. I bet this one looks gorgeous on metal. Uh, that one is actually installed right now. So um, if if someone does buy it, I have to go retrieve it. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, I've seen a few of these others. Um, and they look gorgeous, but I remember that one definitely stands out to me as one I remember that would look gorgeous on metal. I think that was I think that was on my wall behind me mm-hmm. in the other house for quite a while. So yeah, awesome. Well, I have to check cool. those out. All right, so that will end it for this week. Um, until next show, keep shooting. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.